We're delighted to have you back to this uh, show, Think Tech Hawaii's Human and Humane Architecture. This is our 255th show, and you're around our 13,700 viewers. Thank you for that. And we is spiritually with us, our co-host is Soto Brown in his Bishop Museum, Honolulu, Hawaii. And he has to be there physically and on duty because unexpectedly he had to give a tour of the recent exhibit. So physically, it will just be me, your host Martin Despang, and I am back freshly to our Honolulu, Hawaii, which is great to be back. And uh, also who's back, Eric, our producer. Hi, Eric. And both of us uh, share, as we were talking just before the show, and escaping the heats. And it's high summer here in Honolulu. Don't get that wrong. We're like somewhere in the upper 80s or so, but we were escaping 90s and 100s. So climate change is inevitable. We all feel it and uh, we escape it. So Hawaii must uh, be even more attractive for people. Uh, that is great, but it puts more stress on the islands. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, also, we are in the middle of, of uh, nowhere because we're the most remote from all other landmass, but we want to look at it as the Soto who grew up here as a state that could want to be uh, looking at it as, as they were in the middle of everywhere. And that's a mindset issue and matter that we will work on. And so that means we need to get our mind out and across the somewhat limited horizon that we have here. And uh, we need to do that spiritually and mentally, but also every now and then physically. So uh, mostly we sent me out from time to time to check out other places. And that is what the show sequence is about, that we sent me to Chicago, Illinois, that is just um, you know west of where you, Eric, uh, have been on the East Coast. And it, it shares the same climate. It is uh, very cold in the winter, wind chill of Top, you know, multiple digits below, uh, freaking freezing cold. And in the summer, it's really, really hot. It's actually hotter, as we were just saying, and it's getting hotter through us screwing up uh, as, as mankind and heating things up even more. So it gets into the 90s, into the hundreds. Uh, and it's very humid there. We have very high humidity, even higher than here. Uh, at the bottom of the first page, if we can get that up, Eric, please, uh, you see a recent publication. I have a physical hard copy of that one. This is mine here for the archive, as the Soto knows what that is about. And so this is uh, from a German publisher, DOM, Dome, and they publish uh, city guides of cities they think uh, worthwhile it from all over the world. And we got approached by them to write the Honolulu one that we're working on. And one of the precedent is the one that I was just holding up and that you see at the bottom there, which is the one about my hometown. Um, and uh, at the bottom left is uh, a news from you know, a little while ago that's addressing what we're just talking about, uh, the heat. And the heat is particularly, um, you know, we feel the heat particularly in our urban environments in the city. We call that heat island effect because all these thermal massing surfaces of streets and buildings, they soak up uh, the heat and then they give it back to the uh, surrounding atmosphere, to the air. So you're having significant, uh, you know, uh, hotter temperatures in the city than in the countryside, which is a big issue. And the, you know, the news on the bottom left wasn't particularly about uh, a city, but they choose the picture from my hometown. This is downtown Hanover. The building is a building that about 10 years ago, they tore down a brutalist uh, building, a brutalist mini high rise and placed it, replaced it by this rather generic a commercial building. Uh, no uh, concern was to, I mean, if, you, if you're picking, if you're picking up a carbon footprint that has been created by something that was poured in place, uh, likely, uh, you know, in the 70s, some 50 years ago, you better, you know, continue to get that footprint out of it. If you demolish that, um, I was just sent by one of my emerging uh, talents uh, colleagues, uh, Jazz sent me a, a YouTube of the architect, uh, Thomas Heatherwick, who was addressing that and saying, we should try to keep things, everything, not just architecture, keep buildings, renovate, 
rejuvenate them. We should, you know, recycle everything. We should upscale, upcycle things. We should drive our cars until they break down, and not before that, you know, you know, you know, become victimized of the temptation of the car industries that tell us to buy new ones. And that is even true with electric vehicles. It takes for a Tesla around. 100,000 miles to break even to be more ecological than a fossil fuel car. So with everything, we should do that. In that case, they were tearing this down. And if you tear something down, as we keep saying, you should replace it with something significantly better, especially these days uh, from its uh, performance, its energy performance. That building hasn't been. So my little uh, you know, weekly German lesson for the soda would have been, they say, hey, kaum auszuhalten and kaum schatten ist in Sicht. By Temperaturen jenseits der 40 Grad. Translating that it means it's hard, it's unbearable, and there's hardly any shade to be in uh, with temperatures around 40 degrees, and that converts to 100 Fahrenheit. So damn hot. Um, you know, our contributions, which they feature in the book, try to mitigate that uh, in terms of uh, not just architecturally, but typologically, it's important. They have primarily here educational buildings as kindergartens and school and walkable grocery communities because the number two uh, energy consumer fossil uh, energy consumer is uh, mobility, is cars, is combustion cars, and we want to get uh, these out of our cities. Uh, I'm broadcasting, by the way, from our Waikiki Grand Hotel, which is uh, privileged uh, because in many ways, uh, it's, I keep it easy breezy, but uh, we're broadcasting live from the bathroom because otherwise the noise of the combustion engines wouldn't make it impossible for you to hear me. So we got to work on these issues, get the cars out, get the buildings open again, and then we're really uh, paradise what uh, we used to be before contact and what we should be again uh, in the future. So um, the top row show quotes is, you know, the majority of people um, actually live in cities. In 2008, statistically, we reached that point that more cities live in urban areas than on the countryside in the United States. I looked up that already was true in 1920, that early. So they were a trendsetter to that trend. And again, the cities have, we talked about the cons of city, they overheat, they're congested. So we got to need to work on cities to make them more like the countryside because the a constant conflict with our exotic escapism as per Susanna is that she's a country girl and I'm a city guy. So in order to make her being equally excited about my city, um, he, she the country girl, I gotta transform the city, which we're working on to have the same qualities as the countryside because we cannot afford to waste any more land we need this urgently for agriculture to keep the country country as we say it here and to make the city uh, the city. That's what we really, really need to do. And then, um, and especially here on the island where we're basically squeezed in between two mountain ranges, we can't afford to stay uh, only a few stories. I know, and our publisher, Philip Moiser, hi Philip, um, and uh, I appreciate the agreement to disagree. Uh, I, the way I grew up, the way you grew up was the four to five to six story walk up. In my case, even without elevator, it kept me in shape. And our, you know, boss in the building just turned a hundred, uh, you know, a little while ago. So this is all, this is all good. This is all true. But again, with the population growth we're having here, um, I believe, um, although if you compare, that's his point. If you compare and saying you build really dense, and this European city model, five to six uh, stories blocks, keep the, the street profiles really tight, have courtyards to breathe um, and uh, in, the, in the center, you could get uh, a density that is rather close to a high rise where traditionally you need space in between the high rises. Not so much here if you would introduce a different uh, generation of high rises that Kurt Sandburn calls like stacked lanai's that we used to have in that century and we want them again. Then you could get really, really close and shade each other just like the trees do in the jungle or in the forest. And we will increasingly talk about that. But for now, we wanna look again above and beyond our horizon and look at another city that we have many similarities 
with, or at least uh, we want to have, as we found out in the last couple of shows. I, I counted them. There was like the last 25 shows were about developments on the island here and assessing them and evaluating that. So now we need to, and we found out that there are certain ties and uh, references to the other windy city, which is Chicago, how they call it. And it's by the way, it doesn't have to do with the trade winds as here, but it's sort of a political uh, story behind that. We get to the next slide, please. So how do you approach a city? Obviously the city guys is a great way to have a handbook in your hand. But in this case here, uh, a recommendation for us in Hawaii, there is the AIA and they have a downtown office, um, but it's not open all the time and it doesn't have the capacity that this institution here has. This is the architectural center in downtown Chicago, uh, right on the uh, Chicago River that is behind me and very close to Lake Michigan. And that's why we call show how we call it with the four S's because there is a shoreline affinity between our two cities. Uh, this is uh, perfectly positioned um, in a Mies van der Rohe building that German architect who, uh, because of Hitler, uh, left uh, Germany, his home country, and made his major career in the United States. And Mies van der Rohe built a building that we see down there, which is 111 East like a drive or one Illinois center. And it's one of Mises late buildings because he died in 69 and this building was completed in 70. So he didn't even witness its inauguration anymore. And, and what they have as the display there, which we zoom in at the top uh, is what energy revolution, right? Everyone cares for so sustainability, ecological concerns, however you want to call it is in the forefront of our attention as a society and as a profession and a discipline as an architecture. And so here it says blueprint for a carbon free future. The project to the right on that one is the bullet center that's actually ironically not in Chicago, that's in Seattle, Washington. But the one at the top left is, this is probably the most iconic building that I was holding up my old, as uh, our son Yoni taught and told me now vintage uh, little Lego tower of the formerly uh, called or initially called Sears Tower and now being called uh, the, uh, the Willis Tower. And the Willis Tower was built just after the first major oil crisis then different than the ones we have now. Uh, thanks to, or not thanks, of course, to Putin and others. This one was politically caused and not just um, uh, and, and not just resource caused. Obviously, today they're caused by both reasons. So the building, of course, didn't have you know energy efficiency on his radar because that was the big wake up call. Ooh, there's something you know um, you know fossil fuel. And you know the Arabs giving it to us. This is not you know a, 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 a thing that can go on forever, or it could be disturbed and disrupted. And so that was uh, that that era of that building. And obviously here with a sort of thermal camera taking the picture. The question is how do buildings in skyline cities uh, perform? And to say this already again, we described the climate in Chicago. Um, the, in the summertime, you want to shade yourself from the sun, just like here, or even more, because this could be even hotter. Uh, but in the wintertime, um, the, uh, the buildings you know, want to bundle up. And so the glass that we see, that really makes little to no sense, as we keep saying, at least not as fixed glazing in Honolulu, makes sense in Chicago because it keeps you warm. But again, um, it would be great if uh, that could also basically passively heat you. But um, you know, because land is scarce still there and very valuable, you put the high rises pretty close to each other. So you're hardly ever getting any sun in the streets, which again, here in Honolulu, great thing all year round. Uh, keep yourself cool through shading each other, but not so much uh, in Chicago. The next slide, let's quickly look into the Chicago Architecture Center here. Uh, this is uh, one major exhibit that we're focusing on here at this point. 
that is um, by an architectural company. They're called um, uh, Smith and Gill, Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill. Uh, they used to be head designers, chief designers, principals, whatever, in the firm of Skidmore Owings Merrill, who uh, is headquartered in um, Chicago. And the show quote at the top right, uh, we talked about that firm because we're blessed with two uh, great buildings by them. One is the famous Mauna Kea Beach Hotel on the Big Island, and the other one is our School of Engineering, Richards Hall, both SOM buildings. And again, here, even back then in the show, we showed their most iconic building, uh, the Sears Tower, now Willie's Tower. Um, I might have shared, but it's worth repeating, um, uh, that uh, when I was previously in the desert at the University of Arizona or in the prairie, my home away from home, we had and took the chance more because it was easier to take the emerging generation to other cities. And Chicago was our favorite that we frequently did field trips to. And um, before, right at the end of my Prairie era, uh, we toured the office of SOM. They were kindly to show us the office. Uh, they had two projects on that table, major projects that they took a lot of time explaining to us with a big stack of construction documents. Both were projects that rather shocked us. Uh, one was the Trump Tower, for obvious reasons, um, of who's behind that, who then we, in our wildest dreams, we wouldn't have known that that guy would represent us as a president. Uh, and so um, they were working on that one and they were really appalled because they said, well, we had designed it in a way that we gave it these um, clip-on glass fins on the, on the, on the post and the emollients and and Trump was value engineering that away. And we said, well, you should have known that. If, if anything, isn't he known as a capitalist? And capitalism basically only does what it can make money off. And Trump didn't think that was you know, fancy enough, I guess, glitzy enough. So he basically nixed it. Um, and then as far as the, the building design, they basically said, well, um, when we asked for the concept, they said, well, we got so many floors. And then we step back because of the neighboring building and so on. We're saying, well, wait a minute, that sounds like zoning in the 1930s in order to get that light and air into the cities and not suffocate yourself. And also look at the Sears Tower again. That's what the Sears Tower does. So there was really nothing new. But it got even worse because the other project was, was what ended up being called the Borj Khalifa, the at that time and still tallest building in the world in the desert, in the Arab desert. And we once again said, what's the concept? And they said, well, it's a desert flower. And we were still keeping the hopes up high and giving it the benefit of doubt, although we had a little bit bad of a preconceived taste already from the Trump Tower story. And they basically indeed said, well, um, we said, well, how does it perform like a desert flower that survives and keeps its hydration, even though it's dry? And they said, no, it just looks like a desert flower in plant. And we were really, really shocked and paralyzed. and had to talk about that a lot. Um, next time I went there with my Arizona emerging generation and there was another German guy who gave us the tour. And he basically, when I asked him why he chose to work for SOM, he basically said because of one building that is his favorite and that um, is compatible with uh, my uh, taste. Uh, that is the building that we see on the show quote on the very right, the three pictures above each other. And that is, as we stated here, the National Bank of Commerce in Jeddah in the Arab world. And that is um, amazingly from the uh, time that we remember as the least progressive because that's the Reagan era. This is the eighties where even though we had learned, we should have learned the lesson from the oil crisis in, in, in the early seventies, uh, uh, Jimmy Carter who, wanted us to, re to, to learn that lesson and to change things than was next by the American people who wanted that guy who told them, well, keep on going the excessive way of comfort, commodity and convenience that we're so used to. And they choose the guy who promised them that and that was a cowboy Ronnie Reagan. And in that mindset, unfortunately, I believe little exceptions to the rule, some terms we're, we're basically still in. And SOM very brave. Uh, was fighting that with his tower in the in the in the mid 80s or in the early 80s 1983 by basically looking very close at the culture how they built 
with courtyards and always staying in the shade and blending and merging that with the all American typology of a high rise. And they basically in this in, in plan triangular building, they basically included, uh, inserted these triangular courtyards and twisted that around the building. And that's why you get this rather opaque facades with these big cutouts uh, that then they have greenery there and, and hanging garden, Babylonian garden. So really, really innovative uh, for its time. So um, anyway, so uh, who was at that time the chief designer of the not so uh, you know, thrilling buildings of the Trump Hotel and the Burj Khalifa was Adrian Smith. And he then basically split off the firm. However, at the bottom right, you see a project in China about a decade ago that he did. And that was his big sort of coming out or getting off, uh, starting his own firm with uh, his agenda to make the most sustainable high rise. And that's the one you see at the bottom uh, right there. Uh, that one has all the whistles and bells. It's a high tech approach, um, has, uh, you know, wind turbines and foldable takes and double facades, so all the whistles and bells you can think of. Not passive systems, not easy breezy stack lanise, but basically taking a high tech approach. And so he will do uh, with, um, Eric, if you can stay on that zoom in for a little while that you just were, that little foot of that uh, model you see at the bottom right is their, is their next project. And that's in Jeddah again in Saudi Arabia. And again, uh, high rises are a very sort of competitive um, vein typology and they always want to top each other and everyone wants to be the tallest one. So this one that takes the next step and aim to basically be the, the, the tallest high rise. And they have this pretty large scale model in that architectural center and showcase and we can only believe and hope that again, it is not along the lines of the Trump Tower or the Burj Khalifa, but more of that China Tower um, as um, you know, being ecologically concerned uh, and, um, and, um, and interested and committed, so to speak. Next slide, please. So uh, there is an architectural guide out there uh, by DOM in Chicago that Philip Moiser kindly gave me the, the pre-version of it that I had. Um, again, again, if you go to Chicago, how are you going to navigate yourself? And we basically use the book um, intensively. We're very happy to. But we also you know, try to find things on our own um, as sort of informed citizens. Um, uh, being on your own at the very top right, you see show quotes from when I came back to coach uh, in uh, the prairie and got myself my second American dream, big bulge, the awesome quads on my Lincoln Continental. Our host of this uh, show sequence here is Dan Kubrick, my best buddy in the US, who uh, without whom I wouldn't be where, where I am at all. And so he basically one year um, had me drive over these only nine hours from from Lincoln, Nebraska to Chicago, I'll leave my town car there to then have uh, my family come for uh, what I was calling and planning to do the promotion to, trip to have them come over and stay with me. And so when I had my, um, my big boat, I uh, used a guidebook that I had since school days. Um, and that's all there was at that time because there was no internet. At least it was premature at that time. That's how time flies by and how one feels really old. Um, I was driving into the burbs to find this project um, that I only had a picture I took from the book at the very top right. These are courtyard houses that uh, disciples um, of Mies van der Rohe basically had built. So that was then, uh, now is now, this is the courtyard, thank you, exact, exactly. So um, uh, DOM publisher makes it really easy uh, because there is QR codes in there. Uh, that basically give you um, the link to Google Maps. So it's very easy for you if you put this in your GPS and it navigates you to the project uh, where, where you want to be. Uh, we will take advantage of our form at Think Tech Hawaii and our 255 shows to also QR code link them. So you guys, if you want to know more about one building or the other, you can watch the show. Uh, bottom right is another publication that we show quote here. This is when I wrote an article in the Chinese Detail Magazine and I featured 
Chicago. This is here uh, Mises' uh, most iconic residential, high-rise residential project, uh, the Lakeshore Drive Apartments. And back then, um, I saw the lady up there with the bananas in the blue home dress. Basically, we saw, and next slide, um, at the back of the building on the ground floor, um, and uh, I went there again. So who, this is a proof of evidence that Mies was a sustainable architect, which no one would have thought. And of course, the building envelope isn't quiet because that one technology wasn't as advanced as his idea. So it was single pane glass and there are images that I couldn't find, but I saw them, I swear, where the residents, when the winter comes and the lake affects snow and they wanna keep it like 70-ish inside and outside at 20 below, uh, with the windshield of 40 below, they basically, the condensation happened on the inside of the window and they were scraping the ice of the window. By now, I believe um, likely in some of the renovations ever since, uh, because the building as we stayed down there was built in the early fifties has been replaced at least by double pane, uh, but still uh, the building you know, is um, basically a fossil formalism uh, of um, basically a, a hopeful one at that time, because again, in the 50s, one was decades away, two decades away from finding out where the trouble of, of fossil fuel basically is. But as far as typologically, he was, he had a sustainable concern because sustainability means again, cutting down uh, transportation. So here you don't need to get into your multiple uh, multi-story parking garage below underground that most high rises have and have to have per code to buy your banana or your donut. Here you can go down into the integrated, into the building convenience store, grocery store. In Kakaaka, we have one big Whole Foods or whatever it is, right? Uh, but that's one big thing here. It's rather decentralized. And we once talked to the owner and he said he had one in another building that there were some arguments and some issues. And so he got kicked out. And at that point when we talked, he said they're begging him to come back because even the property value went down because that amenity wasn't there anymore. So that's something to learn as well, potentially for us in Hawaii, whenever we build a high rise, why don't we have a little, let's even go further and say a little farmer's market uh, in each uh, ground floor of each building. So this is another suggestion and we will have more of these for you uh, in the next couple of shows where we continue to be in Chicago through me and uh, walk you around and see what's different there and what wants to be the same and what can we learn from what maybe we want to do and maybe what we shouldn't do. So with that, we're at the end of the show. Um, see you next week. Uh, the solo back then, please, please, because it's been too long, two weeks that we haven't been together. And until then, please stay healthy, of course, and easy breezy, breezily easy. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.